Welcome to Inner Compass. I'm Karen Salpi. It may be hard to believe that $50 could lift a family out of poverty for good, but it's happening every day around the world through simple microfinance lending partnerships. Today's guest has not only watched it happen, he's dedicated his life to helping others watch too through film. Join us on Inner Compass. From the campus of Calvin College, this is Inner Compass, exploring how people use faith and ethics to guide them through critical issues of today. My guest today is Robert Roy, a social issue documentary filmmaker and one of the world's foremost chroniclers of microfinance, an innovative strategy that has helped millions of families escape poverty. Welcome, Robert. Thanks. Uh, Thanks be before here. we talk about microfinance, uh, we'll back up a little bit. You started out with a pretty successful career in Hollywood as a filmmaker. Tell me about that. I was accepted into a training program that the Directors Guild offers uh, annually to uh, a handful of young people. What and, an opportunity. Uh, it was a great opportunity. I worked at minimum wage for about two years on various projects that kept moving you around. Mm -hmm. and, um, and some of them were not so great and others were really exciting. All of them were interesting in some way, some of them on a ma sort of a masochistic uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. level. Yeah. But uh, at the end of it I, I became an assistant director and when you become a first assistant director you actually run the set where you make sure everything happens when it's supposed to happen. So for any given shot you have to make sure the coordinate with the departments and you have assistants who help you do that, mm -hmm. lots of walkie-talkies to make sure that the actors and the actors wardrobe, props, special effects, transportation, anything that's, that, that's needed for that scene uh, is there. Is in place. And so that the camera never waits. And you do that for the next scene, you do that for the next day, you plan into the next week. Things were going well, you were doing a little bit of volunteering on the side, right? And then what changed the course of, of your career? Why aren't you still doing Hollywood work? Well, uh, you mentioned the volunteer work. Um, I had resolved to, um, to deal with social issues, social inequity, mm -hmm. and I had come face to face uh, with it on a previous project in South America that just really hit me, always the juxtaposition of, of wealth and poverty. Sure, on especially whole, in that career then, to, to go from Charlie's Angel set to, to extreme yeah, poverty. Yeah, and, and, uh, and uh, it was a qualitative difference from anything I'd seen in the United States. Mm -hmm. You know, and I'd seen pictures, but it's not the same thing as really being there. Sure. And realize that that, that reality of the so-called developing world was really grim for so many people. So I wanted to address that somehow. I thought maybe I could address that through art in Hollywood if I were ever to get to the point of directing. But I just felt that the whole climate and the whole uh, uh, mindset of the people I worked with, nice people for, for the most part, mm -hmm. hardworking people, mm -hmm. professionals, consummate professionals, but, but we, ne we didn't have that same wish in common. So fortunately I was able uh, to take time off between assistant director projects mm -hmm. and I sent out letters to some international development organizations saying I can volunteer and my filmmaking skills and if we can find our expenses and we, we do it cheaply, I can help you make little movies that you can use to tell people about your work. So promotional materials. Yeah. So I did that for several years and just uh, I'd salt in a few of those along with the assistant director work. Mm -hmm. And then actually in 1990 came a real turning point, a really important trip that really changed my life. Uh, on one of these volunteer uh, trips, I went with, with a group to Bangladesh, mm -hmm. which uh, um, I knew from past uh, uh, descriptions like Henry Kissinger's as being the basket case of the world. Um, and I met the women of Grameen. Grameen Bank loans money to uh, poor women. In 1990, I think the average size loan was $75, which doesn't sound like a lot for us, but if you live in a, in a small village economy, it's a substantial amount of money. And, and if you live in a small um, village, the, the only way you're gonna feed your family is to be self-employed. You make something uh, and uh, add value to it and then you sell it, and then you get more raw materials and so on. Mm -hmm. um, or you 
buy rice and you do the parboiling and you do the threshing so that it's edible and then you sell that and you essentially sell it for a higher price. That's a business. And so instead of just going to work at the factory, you really have to, you really have to make your own. And this is true in many parts of the world, right? right. That, that we don't have, we, right. things we take for granted in America, even in terms of going to find a job, you've got to make your job. Yes. There are no factories in rural mm -hmm. Bangladesh or very few. Mm -hmm. And that's true really all over the world. Well, how did uh, Grameen Bank get started then? And, and this idea of micro loans being then small amounts, or what are to us small amounts? Yeah. Um, back in the 70s, uh, when Bangladesh really was a basket case, mm. uh, it had just gained its independence, but at a great price in terms of lives lost and, and infrastructure ruined, people displaced. Uh, Muhammad Yunus was a young economics professor at Chittagong University. And he and some of his students started taking tours of some of the nearby villages because things were so bad. It was, what can we do other than theory? Mm -hmm. What can we do to make things better for them right now? Mm -hmm. And so he met a group of women, and there's one whose name is Joraman. She's famous now because of this, who made um, uh, bamboo stools, very well made. And it's really a staple of furniture in, in the courtyards of Bangladesh. So I said, uh, let's go and talk to her. So we went there, and she was very shy. She ran away. And finally, we got into talking, asking how much money she makes. So she told me that uh, she makes only two cents a day. I couldn't believe why she makes two cents a day for making that. And I said, why can't you sell it uh, to a higher price? I said, I can't sell it to anybody because I have to sell it to this person. I said, why? Because I borrowed money from him. Why did you borrow? Because I didn't have the bamboo, which goes into these bamboo stools. So in order to buy the bamboo, I need the money. So I had to borrow from the trader, and he lent me the money with the condition that I must sell my uh, bamboo stools to him only and he decides the price. I have no control over the price. Uh, can you get more price if you sell it outside? Of course I can get more price if I sell outside, but I can't because I'm promise bound to sell it to him at the price that he gives me. And otherwise he will not give me the money and I can't do anything. So I realized that uh, by borrowing money, she has become a slave labor to that person. Next day I decided to, to go around and see if there are more people like her. When my list was complete, I had 42 names on that list, and the total money they borrowed was $27. And I was shocked. This I never realized that could happen uh, anywhere. People are suffering not for millions of dollars or billions of dollars, for a few pennies. And there's nothing anybody has done to get rid of this situation. So my, my first feeling is, why don't I give this money to the people here to let's re repay the money lenders so that they can become free, which is a very simple thing to do, $27. You free 42 people right away. So I did exactly that. Ask them to give me back whenever they have money to pay back. Then something happened. The excitement that created in those people hooked me on. They thought this was a kind of a miracle that happened because they couldn't think anybody could come up and do such th thing. So they looked up to me as if I had done a great thing. I said, all I did is a few dollars worth of money, that's all. Then another thought came to my mind. The thought is a very simple one. If you can make so many people so happy with such a small amount of money, why shouldn't you do more of it? So he loaned to more uh, people and more and more. And he, it was a real struggle to get uh, people on his side to do this. But he succeeded finally. And 15 years later, when I met him, Grameen Bank was loaning to 700,000 women. Wow. Sounds impressive. Now uh, Grameen Bank loans to 7.5 million women. Oh my goodness. Yeah. And that's, what, and that's uh, the best known and most maybe important microfinance bank in the world, but it's not the only one anymore. No. In fact, even in Bangladesh, to, I should give due, due credit to two other organization, uh, organizations, uh, ASHA and BRAC, especially BRAC, who started, which started 
right after the War for Independence too, and did so many other things besides microfinance, and then discovered microfinance uh, worked and, and added it to, and now it's a principal element. So these are very small loans, and I think, I think Eunice said at one point he discovered that with under $30 he could help several women. And, and it is, first of all, usually women that receive these loans, maybe because they need them the most, but also from what I've read, they're less likely to default on the loans. They're very reliable in terms of repayment. Yeah. Why is that, do you think? Well, here was, here was Eunice's actual uh, experience. In Bangladesh, women are, ha had nothing to do with banks. Mm -hmm. If a woman needed to take out a loan, first of all, she probably wouldn't, have to, wouldn't be poor. She'd be in a wealthier family, and even then, if a woman wanted to take out a loan, if she were middle class, her father or her brother or her son would have to sign for the loan. I mean, that's how bad it was. Mm -hmm. So Eunice was revolutionary in offering loans initially 50% to men, about 50% to women. Okay, so even that was an extraordinary movement forward in terms of women's rights. Yes, and about a year later, they changed it to all women. Why? Because the women were paying back the loans at a rate of a, almost 100%. Mm -hmm. The men were paying back the loans at a rate of about 60%. Wow, why the difference, do you think? I think the, women, the men just felt it was entitlement. You can't be serious, you can't, you know, they're, they were used to development where things were gifts and not loans. Mm -hmm. It took them longer to, to understand the obligation involved. Mm -hmm. They didn't quite need the loans as well, so they weren't quite as protective of their, their reputation for taking out the next loan. Uh, I think a little bit of all of those things. Um, uh, care for the family, the, the, the women are closest to the children, mm -hmm. as they are in many societies. And uh, that was the other thing that, that Eunice and his bank workers soon realized is that the profits from those businesses of the women went into the stomachs and into the minds and to the school education of the kids. With men, sometimes it did, but not always. So One of the things that I saw in your documentary is that in some of these systems, if one borrower defaults, her fellow borrowers are still responsible for covering right. for covering which, that loan. Which sounds harsh. It sounds harsh that, well, if you can't pay, sorry, your four friends are going to have to pay for you whether they like it or not. Mm -hmm. And in fact, if the person's being flippant and there's a reason, that causes us a lot sure. of pressure. Oh, sure. yeah. Hey, get back with the program, right. pull your own weight. Right. But on the other hand, it's tremendous uh, peer support mm -hmm. because often if a woman can't pay, Generally speaking, that women want to repay. So there's a Because reason. if they repay, yeah. they, not a, they'll continue, the spigot will continue their way. They can get a slightly larger loan and do more things with their business. Um, but if they can't pay, it often is because one of the breadwinners, her or her husband, is ill. Uh, or maybe the shipment of rice that they were expecting, with, uh, the truck had an accident and it was contaminated or destroyed. So then she needs other kinds of she help. She needs other kind of help, yeah. uh, people to pitch in with their business or to take care of her children so she can really concentrate on getting her business back on her feet. I'm to get a handle on this, why, I mean, it, it seems like if, if I were Eunice and I saw that $27 would solve a lot of problems, I'd be inclined to just give people the money and walk away. But, but the fact that this money has to be repaid is building all kinds of credibility and responsibility and sense of community, mm -hmm. right? It's freedom in that we're not telling you what to do with the money. Mm -hmm. You're in charge of the money, which is empowerment of the person, right. unlike a lot of development uh, initiatives. With lots of strings attached. And then it's responsibility. You gotta pay it back, and you have, you have to pay it back on time with a reasonable rate of interest. And there is this pride that I sense in dealing with these women, this satisfaction that they paid back those loans, they fulfilled a business proposition. They were business women. They weren't passive recipients. And they were obviously intensely satisfied with the palpable improvement in their families' lives. Yeah, and, uh, sure. and I've been on the ground enough to say that that is the case more often than not, that there's that kind of improvement. And it builds their status within the community so that they're treated better uh, just generally. Well, you, okay, so, so you learned about this and you felt pretty passionate about it. Did you instantly drop everything and devote your life to that or was this a slower process? It was ratcheting up. It actually took me because I had to self-finance this. I wanted to make a documentary for PBS about this subject mm -hmm. and, a, and an in-depth one so people really understood how it works, why it's so good, and also things to be careful of, some limitations. 
Uh, it is not a magic bullet for, de for development. It's just a good one. Mm -hmm. um, and it was a, a lengthy process of getting people interested, talking to prospective funders, doing research. I and a crew at my own expense went back to Bangladesh in 1992 to shoot more footage. I put that together so I could start to show to people. But I had to take time off and earn a living right. um, as an assistant director. So I could only really pursue it half time. Mm -hmm. And even then, with the, the good graces of my family, my, my wife sure, and kids who saw me going in two directions, plus trying to be a husband and a father, oh, which yeah. was, a, was difficult. And by... 1992, I had the interest of the foundations. By 1995, I knew which programs I wanted to profile around the world. I wanted to profile more than just Bangladesh mm -hmm. and also in this country. And uh, by 1998, it was done. And it aired on, as a two-part series on, on PBS. Mm -hmm. And it is a very even-handed documentary. I mean, it's not all, this is great, this is great, this is great. It does, it does reveal the, the problems and the weaknesses. Yeah, yeah, and I, we, we still distribute it quite a bit and, and largely to, uh, to people who are really interested in that aspect of it. So a lot of, lot, of, uh, lot of educational institutions, for instance, who really want that kind of overview that's not too filtered. Now, you're going to be a little biased because you're a filmmaker, but there's a reason you wanted to be a filmmaker. What what is it that video can do to inform people that's 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 better that's that's so effective in telling the stories that you want to tell well if it's done well it's almost like being there there is no substitute for actually being there but the but the reality is most people in this country are not going to sit down on a hillside with someone in nepal or in a courtyard in bangladesh or or places like that and I've had the privilege of doing that now over the last 15 years in, with hundreds of women. What goes through your head then as you're trying to, you, you have a conversation, you have an experience, you're there, and you want to share that with viewers in a way that helps us come closer to experiencing it. Because we've all seen pictures and we've all seen statistics and we can turn away pretty quickly from those things. Um, so what are some of the things that you consider as you, as mm -hmm. you set up your, your footage? Well, fortunately, I know what, it, what I'm producing is going to be, uh, will play longer than the average clip mm -hmm. on CNN mm -hmm. or NBC, because there well, you get this kind of one in your face and, and you get somebody uttering a half a sentence and then it's... And they're gone. Uh, and that's all you're going to hear of them. And so, and it's usually sort of not a lot of thought involved. It's somebody in a crisis mode and what are you thinking? Oh, my poor child is buried under this rubble. It's kind of, yeah. it's always it's disasters. Dramatic, dramatic. It's all, it, and, and it paints a picture, unfortunately, this mass media that we have of people who are writhing in destitution mm -hmm. and so weak they cannot think or work for themselves. When what I found and what I try to convey is People are dynamic and capable of great things everywhere. Mm -hmm. There's a wonderful clip of Muhammad Yunus, for instance, where he talks about the bonsai tree. And he says, poor people are like bonsai trees. Uh, you pick the uh, seed of the tallest tree in the forest and then take the best seed out of that and plant it in a flower pot. You got a tiny little tree and call it a bonsai. Nothing wrong with the seed. We got the best seed possible. Nothing wrong with the tree because we picked the tallest tree in the forest. But actually it grows this far. Why? Because we put them into a flower pot, the base. Society is the base. And society is so stingy, it doesn't give them this, the poor people space to grow. So I said, change the base. If you change the base, anybody will be as tall as anybody else. And so uh, that simple analogy rings very true to me yeah. that and it's it's e easy to say change the pot but the changing the pot is a big job but it is something that i'm convinced that that uh, with enough public will can be done and so part of what you're trying to do in your film is give people a little a little more space to be in let's look at a clip I sold vegetables. Sometimes I wouldn't even get my money back. Sometimes I would make less than 50 cents. I would use it to buy a little food. Patience Iyamu lives in Benin City, Nigeria. Widowed at an early age, she struggled to support herself and her two children. One day, Patience heard about Lapo. 
LAPO, the Lift Above Poverty Organization, is on the front lines of Nigeria's fight against poverty. With Grameen Foundation USA's support, LAPO employs a bold new strategy, microfinance. It makes small loans to almost 20,000 poor women to help them start and expand tiny businesses that can be a pathway to a better life. Grameen Foundation USA believes that microfinance is the most powerful anti-poverty strategy ever developed. I rented a grinding machine with the money. I said to myself, this is very good. I had been so thin from not eating, I started to recover. My children, with the first loan, I was able to put them in school. I got another loan, and I used it to buy my own grinding machine. With greater profits and more loans, Patience has bought two more machines. On good days, I make ten times as much money as before. Microfinance applies business principles in support of a social mission. Lending is based on social collateral. People support each other and hold one another accountable. If a woman cannot repay because of a personal emergency, the other borrowers are expected to help her through her difficulties. You really develop a spirit of community that I don't think happens when they just get a grant which is just on a one-to-one -one basis. For LAPO, social collateral has produced a repayment rate of 97%. Wow. So we get to spend a little bit of time with, with the woman that we're hearing and see what her life looks like and her work looks like day to day. I always work through the organization that has a relationship with the women and they often help me find interesting women, although I make the final choice of who we're, mm -hmm. who we're covering. And so there's some element of trust already. And the way um, I try to work it is to find some place comfortable to the woman where she's not in some strange situation, uh, her workplace, but more likely her home. Someplace very quiet, and if at all possible, with the help of a couple of friends, make sure that her family, even um, uh, her husband and neighbors, neighbor kids all come and they want to be part of it. So it's <laughs> creating a space so that she has a feeling of privacy. And then we sit very close to each other. Mm -hmm. uh, part of that is the nature of trying to get Im uh, a visual image of intimacy for me. Sure. It's really this close. I'll be this close really, to the yeah, person. Yeah. And my translator may sit this close to the camera here. And it's, uh, it's a four-way conversation. I'll ask it in English. The translator will ask in Bangla or Swahili. And then the answer comes. And she'll look at the translator, not me, because that's the conversation that's really going on. Sure. So I have to have a good translator who's not only fluent, but also just really warm and good with people. I, I was going to say, I mean, I would think that having that camera that close would be terrifying for, for a lot of people. Yeah. Maybe in a less mass media society, the, they don't understand the implications of that. So they're As so much. so unfamiliar that it doesn't even scare them. Well, also they meet us first, and we take our time before we get to the interview stage. It's not like hi, not knocking on the door. Yeah. Can we interview you? Yeah. Uh, it may take us an hour to get around to that. Okay. Sometimes I'll shoot uh, the woman giving us a tour of her business and showing us her family and other things because it all adds a comfort level. So where she really uh, feels good with us. Um, we sort of sense what we think is required, yeah. but we, we do take our time. And the other thing I, I make sure is that any time I shoot, I shoot on the level. Uh, I'm never the camera slightly above the person, mm -hmm. which is a kind of a condescending right. uh, implication to it, yeah. or above because I want it to be kind of edgy and mm -hmm. things like that. Mm -hmm. I really try to be on the level and I make sure that I, the translator and she are all on the same plane. So, so it's treating her as neutrally and levelly as the level transaction of microfinance that I perceive. I, I was going to say there's a wonderful analogy here mm -hmm. of just dignity and respect for, for people. Um, you're telling their story as honestly as you can. Yeah. Though obviously you have to make choices. I mean, are there times when you want to paint the picture better than it really is so that you can promote this project? Or, or do you feel that it really does tell itself fairly? Well, it depends on what kind of, uh, I think you're, there, there is always that pressure, mm -hmm. sure. And there are always filters that you apply in, in how you make a movie. Mm -hmm. In fact, you can be a fly on the wall verite filmmaker, which I'm not, uh, the kind who 
professes to just be outside and record the reality. Yeah. Just the camera being in the room changes the reality. So there are always filters. Mm -hmm. And in the case of the kind of filmmaking that I'm doing presently, which is often on behalf of what I think is a really fine institution, I don't work for organizations that I have mixed feelings about. Okay. Um, so I, and, and I will try to tell every story as truthfully as possible. Now there's already selections in terms of who we, who we select. Mm -hmm. And some of them have to do not necessarily with how well she's done with the loans, but that could enter into it. Another thing though is just how personable uh, and how much of a connection I think she'll be able to make right. to a Western viewer. Some yeah. are better than others. Yeah. So I'm, a cast, I'm casting yes. in a way. Yeah. Um, there's all sorts of ways in which I end up modeling the the uh, the the reality, um, in a flip sort of way, I sometimes say all film lies. My goal is to make film lie truthfully. Oh, interesting. Frederick Buechner has said that that your calling is where your great joy meets the world's great need, and it sounds as if you have found that just right. I have. I, I definitely have. That's that's that hits it in a, uh, on the nail. Great. Thank you so much. My guest today has been Robert Roy, a social issue documentary filmmaker and one of the world's foremost chroniclers of microfinance. I'm Karen Salpi. Thank you for watching Inner Compass. <laughs>